So uh, tonight I'd like to talk about emergency alerting. And uh, I'm gonna concentrate on wireless emergency alerts because that's where I spent about my last 17 years in my professional life uh, developing wireless emergency alerts. Uh, but I will talk a little bit about the history on how we got to where we are today with wireless emergency alerts, uh, starting back in, in the 50s and, and coming up to today. And with that, let's uh, go ahead to the next slide. So as, as I mentioned, you know, emergency alerting uh, started back in the 50s with the Conrad system, uh, or originally also known as the key station system. And um, I'll go through more details of that. But basically what that was is an organized network of AM radio stations uh, to warn citizens of, of emergencies. Um, during the 60s uh, and up through the 90s, uh, that changed to the emergency broadcast system, uh, which included both radio and TV stations to provide the president with a way to warn the public during a national emergency. Um, in, in the late uh, 90s, uh, the, emer the emergency broadcast system uh, was migrated to the emergency alert system. Uh, which again used radio and TV, but brought in some more uh, digital technology, uh, including specific area message encoding protocols and integrated with the National Weather Service. And then finally, uh, in the present, uh, we are still seeing migration of emergency alerting uh, to the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, uh, which integrates both the emergency alert system uh, as well as the wireless emer emergency alerts, which came into play around 2012. So let's talk about the history of emergency alerting and, and, and looking at prior to 1951. Um, Prior to 51, there was no method that the US government could use to broadcast warnings to citizens in the event of an emergency. And, and, and actually there was a concern that if we did warn them of, of an emergency, uh, it would cause panic. And that was especially true uh, by issuing public uh, forecasts and alerts for tornadoes. Um, radio stations and television networks could interrupt normal programming and issue a bulletin in the event of an emergency. And we saw these, for example, on December 7th, 1941, at the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, the actual first successful tornado warning uh, was issued uh, near Tinker Air Force Base in 1948. And, and actually there were two tornadoes at Tinker Air Force Base that occurred a couple of days apart. The first one, there was no alert given to the public and it caused fairly extensive damage. Uh, a couple of days later, there was a similar storm system coming through and it was decided that uh, it, it, we better inform the public that this storm is coming and there potentially could be additional tornadoes. And that was uh, essentially the first public warning of a, of a tornado that was ever issued. Um, during the 50s uh, and, and into the early 60s, um, uh, that was the you know, beginning of the Cold War. And the major threat of the 50s were not uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which were not developed until the late 50s and early 60s, but from long range bombers. And neither the, the Soviets nor the US had intercontinental ballistic missiles until the end of the 50s. And there were a couple of Soviet bombers that were especially concerning during this period, uh, the Tupolev Tu-4 and the Tu-95. Uh, the Tu-95, uh, codenamed Bear, uh, is, is especially interesting because that uh, bomber is still in use today. Um, the Soviets during that period, they'd undertake frequent missions into the Arctic and, and they would practice transpolar strikes against the United States. And in 1954, uh, Aviation Week published an article uh, which talked about a new Soviet jet bomber that was capable of carrying a nuclear bomb uh, from their bases in the Soviet Union to the US. And this was the M4 Bison. So, so that really raised a lot of concerns that, you know, the potential was there that the Soviets could uh, launch an attack against the continental US. Uh, 
also during those early years, um, we didn't have G uh, GPS, right? There was there was very crude navigation systems in place. Uh, radio navigation, uh, which is the application of radio frequencies to determine the position of an object on the Earth, that was the first uh, radio navigation used uh, for aircraft. Uh, using radio direction finding or, or RDF. And, and the way they did that, uh, I'm sure most of you know, is tune into a radio station, use directional antennas, determine the direction to the broadcasting antenna, uh, take a second measurement. You can then triangulate the two directions, plot them on a map, see where their intersection reveals the location. And then um, um, you can, you can uh, uh, pilot the aircraft to that target. Well, commercial AM stations can be used for this task, and, and, and that was really due to their long range and high power at the time. Um, the, the figure on the right shows actually Amelia Earhart's uh, aircraft, and, and you can see the RDF loop on the top of the aircraft. Well, the concern was that Soviet bombers, uh, which were mentioned on the previous slide, could use radio direction finding to navigate to US targets. They could use the AM radio stations uh, to uh, target, their, uh, you know, target their bomber aircraft uh, to US cities and then you know, launch the attack against the US cities. So in order to alert the public uh, uh, about this in order, and, and also to uh, help offset uh, you know, the, the uh, benefit that Soviet bombers would, would get from uh, using AM stations for targeting, uh, the Conrad or control of electromagnetic radiation system uh, was put into place. Uh, and this was uh, established by President Truman in 1951. Uh, in the event of an emergency, uh, such as a Soviet attack, all U.S. television and FM radio stations were required to stop broadcasting, and most AM uh, stations were shut down, and any stations that stayed on the air would transmit on either 640 or 1240 kilohertz. And, and those who you know, have seen radios back from that era have, have probably noticed that 640 and 1240 had distinctive civil defense markings on those radios. Um, the whole idea is to confuse enemy aircraft who may be navigating using RDF. Um, the stations would transmit for several minutes, then go off the air, and another station would take over on the same frequency and a round robin chain. So that the thought was that the Soviet bombers wouldn't be able to get a lock on any one station at any given time. And as I mentioned, by law, it, all radio sets manufactured between 1953 and 1963 had those two frequencies marked by the all familiar triangle in a circle or civil defense signal uh, on, on the radio dials. Um, this is just an example of the pamphlets that were issued at the time uh, that shows the Conrad, uh, how Conrad works and promoting 640 and 1240, uh, as well as sirens that would be used in, in the event of an emergency. Um, it's interesting to note that in, in uh, 1957, U.S. amateurs actually came under Conrad rules, and amateur stations were also required to stop transmitting if the commercial radio stations went off the air due to an alert. And again, the concern was that amateur radio signals could be used by Soviet bombers' uh, radio direction finding equipment. And if you go back to the FCC rules back in 1958, uh, which were part 12 at, at that time, um, every amateur radio station was required to provide a means of reception of the Conrad al radio alert or the means for the determination that such an alert is in force. And during that alert, the stations had to immediately discontinue uh, operation until the radio all clear is issued. Uh, several companies, uh, including Heathkit, uh, did market special receivers that would uh, could be used to connect uh, directly to your amateur radios that would uh, monitor uh, six, um, the, the 640 and 1240 uh, frequencies 
and automatically turn off the, the transmitters if uh, uh, an alert was issued. Uh, if you also go back to the 1958 Radio Amateurs Handbook, um, there's also uh, uh, circuit designs that are in the handbook uh, for Connell Rad uh, alarm detection, as well as circuits that could be connected to your, your transmitter in order to shut down transmissions at the time of, of, uh, of an alert. So as we um, move forward in time, uh, the, the intercontinental ballistic missiles um, uh, started to be deployed. And this uh, first started in March of 57, when President Eisenhower approved a plan uh, for both Atlas and Titan missiles, and also uh, the launch of Sputnik, uh, an emergency plan was adopted that called for deployment of the first Atl Atlas missiles in 1959 with 123 IBCMs. Um, the Soviet R-7 uh, was first successfully tested on August 21st, 1957. And by the early 1960s, the development of Soviet ICBMs made the Conrad system obsolete. Um, and, and the reason for this is you no longer needed to do radio direction finding. Um, the ICBMs were, were controlled, uh, not using uh, RDF, using AM signals. So the Conrad system uh, no longer was necessary. So on August 5th, 1963, the Emergency Broadcast System, or EBS, uh, was established by President Kennedy that allowed stations to broadcast emergency information while remaining on their assigned frequencies. So no longer did you have the two frequencies on the AM band assigned for emergency information. Uh, any station uh, could broadcast emergency information. And the purpose of uh, the emergency broadcast system was to provide the president with a way of providing, uh, uh, of communicating with the American public in the event of war, threat of war, or any grave national crisis. Um, the nationwide activation of EBS was called an emergency action notification or EAN. And the EBS was actually expanded for peacetime emergencies at the state and local levels. Um, and in order to activate EBS at the national level, uh, origin would have originated by the president and would have been relayed by the White House Communications Agency duty officer to one of two origination points, either the Aerospace Defense Command or the Federal Preparedness Agency. And participating uh, telecommunication common carriers, uh, which at that point was primarily AT&T, uh, the Associated Press, uh, the United Press International, they would also receive and authenticate by means of code words, an emergency action notification, and uh, they would have a special uh, teletypewriter network specifically designed for that purpose, and they would relay the emergency action notification to their subscribers and their affiliates. Um, the EBS was a hierarchy system. There were about three dozen primary stations around the country, uh, which had direct communications with the White House. And these were known as primary entry points. Some were connected to a state emergency authorities and <clears throat> others were responsible for information within their own operational area. Um, these stations, they would originate emergency programming, while the other stations would monitor the primary stations for the EBS messages to rebroadcast. And in a few areas, there were primary relay stations that served as relay points between the primary stations and other stations that were unable to receive the primary stations broadcast. Many areas also had an alternate primary in case one of the critical stations in the link were destroyed or unable to broadcast. And, and what this meant, uh, you know, this whole system meant the White House had a direct connection to all national broadcast networks and wire services, and all affiliate stations were encouraged to monitor them during an emergency as well. Um, there was also what's known as the 500 and 300 nets. 
And at the request of the White House, the national level uh, emergency action notification and any termination of the emergency action uh, would be transmitted by the Continental Air Defense Command and or the United States Army Interagency Communica Communications Agency on what was known as the 500 teletype net. And this would go to radio and TV broadcast networks, as well as AT&T and the radio wire teletype networks. And during that net uh, transmission, um, the 300 telephone net will con would confirm the val validity of the EAN and emergency action termination message, both with the Associated Press and uh, the UPI. Actual activations um, were or, or originated with a primary station uh, known as the Common Patrol Common Program Control Station or CPS CPCS one, and that would transmit the attention signal. and And the attention signal was a mix of the frequencies 853 and 960 hertz played simultaneously. Now that's a probably a familiar tone. If you recall back when EBS did the on-air test, you'd hear that obnoxious tone. That's actually those two frequencies played simultaneously. And what's interesting is we're going to hear about this a little bit later because that's actually the tones that are still used today in, in wireless emergency alerts. Um, decoders at relay stations uh, would sound an alarm. Uh, they'd alert the station personnel to the incoming message. Each relay station would broadcast the alert tone and rebroadcast the emergency message from the primary station. Uh, if a station failed to activate their equipment, um, since this is a chain, uh, the chain would be broken and there would be a segment of the population that would not receive the emergency information. Uh, and to activate the protocol, the Associated Press and, and United Press International Wire Service would notify stations uh, with a special message. And if, if you, you know, these were sent over teletype, and that would begin with a full line of X's and, and a bell inside the teletype machine would sound 10 times. And there would be a confirmation password, which was changed daily to avoid any abuse or mistakes. And there were tests of the emergency broadcast system, uh, typically on Saturday mornings that lasted 35 or 40 seconds. Uh, TV stations would display a test pattern uh, announcing the test was underway. And then you'd hear the familiar phrase, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system, the broadcast in your area are in voluntary cooperation and, and so forth. I won't read the whole phrase there, but it was a standard phrase uh, that was used uh, during every test of the emergency broadcast system. Um, so amateur radio, you know, as I mentioned with with a Conelrad system, amateur radio uh, was required to stop transmitting if if an alert was issued. And again, that was all based on radio direction finding, and they didn't want amateurs to be transmitting and, and give the Soviets uh, any targets to, to, who, to use for their direction finding equipment. Well, since um, that system was stopped, um, the FCC rules for amateurs uh, were removed in, on July 19, 1962. Uh, those rules were deleted. Um, although the operations and emergency rules uh, remained in effect as they do today, no additional rules were in place for radio operators as far as the emergency broadcast system. Now, as, as we progress in time, um, the emergency alert system uh, was developed and became operational in 1997 after being approved by the FCC in November of 1994. And this was developed in order to overcome some of the limitations of the emergency broadcast system and was designed in cooperation with both the Weather Service as well as FEMA. A major difference between EBS and EAS is how the uh, uh, alert broadcast stations are, are how, how the, uh, the method used to alert broadcast stations about an incoming message. Um, the emergency alert system uses digital technology to distribute messages. 
Um, the EAS signal is the same signal that the National Weather Service uses on the NOAA weather radio. Uh, EAS provides not only the president, but also national, state, and local authorities with the ability to provide emergency information, uh, as well as broadcast stations, cable, and wireless cable systems. Um, participation in national EAS alerts, that is alerts from the president, president is mandatory, but state and local participation is voluntary. Um, the emergency action notification message was renamed to the national emergency message, and that's the notice to broadcasters that the president or their designee will deliver a message over EAS. Uh, EAS replaced the weekly on-air tests, uh, broadcast notifications uh, with weekly internal tests and monthly on-air tests. Uh, the EAS messages contain, uh, consist of four parts. There's the digitally encoded specific area message encoding header, an attention signal, an audio announcement, and a digitally encoded end of message marker. The same header uh, includes who originated the alert, uh, was it the president, state or local authorities, the National Weather Service, or a broadcaster? A short general description of the event, such as a tornado, flood, severe thunderstorm. The areas affected, which can include up to 32 counties or states. The expected duration of the event in minutes. The date and time it was issued, as well as an identification of the originating station. EAS, as I mentioned, is all hazards. Um, it, while it is originally designed to allow the president to address the nation within 10 minutes during a national emergency, the president has sole responsibility for determining whether a national level EAS will be activated. However, EAS can also be used by state and local authorities uh, to deliver alert information. And this would include weather alert, amber alerts, uh, and, and other uh, natural occurring alerts, such as earthquakes, forest fires, volcanic activity, uh, technological uh, issues, such as chemical releases, oil spills, nuclear power plant emergencies, and other national emergencies, such as terrorist attacks. Um, the NOAA weather radio is, is part of the emergency alert all hazard system uh, and is one of the dissemination methods for the emergency alert system. Um, within EAS, there's primary entry points, state primaries, and local primaries. Um, the primary entry points, or now known as the National Public Warning System, uh, are broadcast stations located throughout the country that have a direct connection to FEMA and resilient transmission capabilities. And they will provide the initial broadcast of a presidential EAS message. And this is a network of 77 stations that are used to uh, originate the emergency alert and provide warning information to the public before, during, and after incidents and disasters. And the vast majority are AM stations. Um, they are equipped with additional backup uh, and communications equipment and power generators designed to enable uh, them to continue broadcasting in, uh, during and after the event. And in fact, FEMA uh, does provide equipment and grants to these stations in order to deploy the equipment. And, and the, the picture on the right is an installation at WLWAM in Cincinnati. Uh, which was the second modernized system in the National Public Warning System. Um, once a designated station receives an alert, it broadcasts the message to other connected stations, again, in a daisy chain fashion. And state and local governments, uh, they've also designated radio and TV stations, which act as the first sources for state and local broadcasts, just as the national level uses the, the, the primary stations. And this is just a diagram of those 77 uh, stations and the coverage of them. Uh, as you can see, uh, it covers you know, most of the major cities, uh, but there is a good chunk, especially out west, uh, of areas that are not covered uh, by the National Public Warning System.
Uh, FEMA has also developed the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or known as IPAWS. IPAWS is a front end uh, to uh, the national alerting system, which coordinates the distribution of, of, of alert information via multiple channels. Uh, it uses what's known as the Common Alerting Protocol, or CAP, uh, an XML-based data format for exchanging public warning uh, warnings and emergencies between alerting technologies. So the figure on the bottom left shows the general flow uh, from the alerting authorities uh, through the IPAWS open aggregator, through private sector partner systems, uh, such as the wireless emergency alerts or radio and TV broadcast, and finally being received by the general public. Uh, the CAP protocol, uh, the structure is shown on the right, uh, it consists of a number of blocks of information. Uh, first is the alert block itself, uh, which contains things such as the message type, uh, the source, who, who's sourcing it, uh, addressing information, and who the sender is and what the send date and time is. Uh, the info block contains the event category, uh, event type, and then three parameters which are important to define the priority of the alert. And those are the urgency, severity, and certainty. Um, you know, alerts that are very urgent, very severe, and high certainty will receive the highest priority uh, than those that are low urgency um, or, or not severe or have low certainty of, of occurring. Um, also contained in there is event codes. You know, what type of event is this, such as a tornado? Uh, what's the effective date and time, the, the expiration date and time, and again, such fields such as the event description describing what, what type of event this is. Uh, moving to the bottom right uh, is the area description, and that's the impacted area of the alert. Uh, could either be a polygon, uh, which is you, you typically see from the weather service uh, on, on the television screen, <clears throat> during a severe thunderstorm or a tornado alert. Uh, it could be a circle with a radius. Uh, it could be a geocode, um, or, or it could be some other uh, uh, specific definition, such as given the altitude. And, and the resource description uh, has the ability to include various file types within the alert itself. So if you wanted to include a picture or uh, a URL uh, within, within the alert, uh, that can be included within the resource. And this is just an example of a CAP message for a severe thunderstorm warning. Uh, again, it's a XML based uh, uh, language. Um, in the red circle, you'll see uh, the event type is a severe thunderstorm. Um, the severity, certainty, and urgency. Uh, the uh, urgency is immediate. Severity is severe and certainty is observed. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a severe thunderstorm that is being observed. It's a severe thunderstorm and needs immediate action. Um, the, the when is pointing to the expiration time. Uh, you know, when is this alert uh, valid to? Uh, the who is who sent this. Uh, in this case, it's the National Weather Service in Sacramento, California. Uh, the what is a description of the severe thunderstorm, and the where gives the uh, alert of uh, the area where that alert is valid. Um, the IPAWS architecture uh, starts with the alerting authorities on the left side, and this includes federal, state, territorial, tribal, and local authorities uh, that initiate the CAP messages into the FEMA IPAWS open gateway which is an open platform for uh, emergency networks. Um, the IPAWS open then distributes those alerts out to the various alert disseminators. This could be the emergency alert system, uh, commercial mobile services, uh, internet services, uh, NOAA through the uh, NOAA weather radio or any state or local unique alerting systems. And then they're finally disseminated out to the American people through those various dissemination means, including radio and TV broadcasts, cell phones and pagers, web browsers, uh, NOAA weather radio, and so forth. 
Um, there is an EAS operating handbook uh, that is uh, that's used by EAS participants uh, to that handle EAS messages and text tests and outline the operational procedures that are defined in the FCC Part 11 rules, uh, which specify the emergency alert system. So as, as, as I described all those previous systems, most of the dissemination method was, during, was with radio and television broadcasts. Well, beginning in the mid, uh, early to mid 2000s, um, cell phones became ubiquitous. Uh, almost everybody you know, started carrying a cell phone. So post 9-11, one of the lessons learned was the difficulty it was to get information out to citizens uh, after 9-11. So um, Congress, as part of the Warning Alert and Response Network Act of 2006, um, developed um, or, or instructed the FCC to create a commercial mobile service alert advisory committee to establish the protocols, procedures, and requirements to distribute emergency alerts to cell phones. Uh, and the, the advisory committee was composed of representatives from service providers, handset vendors, emergency personnel, uh, individuals with disabilities, and the industry groups. And they produced their first draft report in September of 2007, which defined the wireless emergency alerts basic system architecture and established the technical standards and operating procedures. Uh, it wasn't until 2012, however, that wireless emergency alerts was first deployed uh, because once the um, commercial mobile uh, uh, alert advisory committee completed its work, the FCC had to define the rules uh, and then once the rules were in place, standards had to be developed and um, networks had to be built in order to support it. So it was, wasn't until two, 2012 that WIA was actually deployed. And since then, more than 78,000 wireless emergency alerts have been sent throughout the country. And some of the success stories is more than 123 missing children have been recovered thanks to wireless Amber Alerts, and the program has saved countless lives during severe weather events and other imminent threats. Now, there are several versions of wireless emergency alerts. The first was WIA 1.0, and these were standards that were complete between 2009 and 2011. <clears throat> this defined three classes of alert message, the presidential alert, uh, again, one of the primary reasons for creating any alerting system is to give the president a way of getting information out to the public in times of emergency. So the presidential alert is one of the key classes of alert messages that are defined in wireless emergency alerts. Uh, the second is an imminent threat alert, and this would include things like severe uh, weather events, and the third is the child abduction emergency or AMBER alert. Now, the first, the first version of WIA, um, that it was limited to 90 characters of alphanumeric text. And, and the reason for that is there were a variety of cell technologies and pager technologies in place at that time. Uh, you know, the, 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 the late 2000s, early 2010s. And wireless emergency alerts had to support all the technologies that were deployed at the given time. Also, uh, embedded reference were prohibited, so you couldn't put URLs in, in the link. <clears throat> and the geographic target was very broad, uh, and that was county level or county equivalents, um, of, of, uh, you know, rather than getting to circles, polygons, or, or geocodes. So it was a very broad sweep that wireless emergency alerts would, would, or, would uh, initially support. 
There was also a unique sound and vibration cadence, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, in September of 2016, uh, WIA 2.0 was defined, which increased the alert message length from 90 to 360 characters. And, and this is because technology advanced. Some of the older, older technologies that were limited to 90 characters were no longer in existence. And it also established a new message alert class for public safety messages. So now we have a fourth class uh, in addition to the presidential uh, imminent threat child abduction emergency, the public safety message is a message that allowed public safety agencies to disseminate information to their jurisdictions. Uh, also supported uh, embedded references and multimedia through embedded references was added in, as well as support for Spanish language alert messages, as well as state and local wireless emergency alert testing. And then WIA 3.0 uh, came about in January of 2018. And this uh, really uh, was a major advancement because it narrowed the geotargeting requirements. Uh, it stated that you must deliver uh, an alert message that matched the circle or polygon and has to prevent any overshooting of that circle or polygon by no more than a tenth of a mile. And uh, obviously, you know, it's very dependent upon cell tower locations and so forth. Uh, so if the network is not capable of matching a specific target area, then you have to do the, your best effort in order to try to match that. Uh, it also allowed uh, uh, the consumers to have uh, the, the alert stored on the device for at least 24 hours or until the subscriber uh, deleted the alert. Um, as I mentioned, WIA 1.0 went live in April of 2012, uh, and the National Weather Service began delivering messages on June 28th of 2012, and all the major wireless carriers are participating uh, in wireless emergency alerts. Um, we have 2.0 uh, and 3.0. Actually, you'll see a, a, a timeline there of December 2019 for 2.0 and November 2019 for 3.0. Um, that's actually correct because of the way the deployments happened. Um, we have 3.0 was actually uh, deployed uh, just ahead of we have 2.0. Um, we is uh, disseminated through FEMA IPAWS, as mentioned earlier. Uh, it's one of the paths for getting uh, alerts through um, uh, through the uh, FEMA IPAWS and disseminated, you know, via one of the many means that that can be used. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, along with the FCC and NOAA and others, uh, led the development of, of, of this system and uh, put, put into place, you know, the, the capabilities for deploying this uh, within a timely manner. So let me talk a little bit about the technology. Um, again, the categories that we have today in, in wireless emergency alerts, uh, the presidential alert was actually renamed uh, to be the national alert. Uh, and the reason for that is the, the national alert can be issued by either the president, the president's designee, or the head of FEMA. Uh, the imminent imminent local threats uh, remain the same, amber alerts remain the same, uh, public safety messages remain the same, as well as state and local tests. Excuse me there. <laughs> um, some of the improvements <clears throat> since first deployed uh, include the 360 character messages, uh, the embedded hyperlinks, as well as addition of Spanish in addition to English. Um, again, WIA 1.0 is the 90 character uh, text only messages. WIA 2.0 is 360. And WIA 3.0 adds the capability known as device based geofencing. So, this is enhanced geo targeting. So, you'll only get an alert if you're in an impacted area specified by the emergency alert originator. And it does use the location capabilities of your mobile phone along with the impacted area 
to determine if you are in that impacted area. Um, if your device can't determine its location, uh, for example, if you have GPS turned off, you may receive the alert outside the impacted area. Uh, and, and that's, you know, in order abundance of caution to make sure that you get the alert in the, in the event you may be within that area. Um, just a little bit on the wireless network itself. Um, it, it is resource limited. That is, there's an oversubscription. There's limited spectrum available, and there's not enough spectrum to de dedicate resources to every wireless user. And with over 400 million wireless subscribers in the US, it's physically impossible to dedicate network resources and radio channels to everybody that has a mobile phone. It's also contention-based. The users are gonna contend for available resources. <clears throat> the scarce spectrum is shared by all users and the network is engineered to the busy hour. That is, what's the expected load on the network at the busiest hour of the day? Uh, and there's also wireless priority access and the government emergency telecommunication service, which provides priority to uh, users that have uh, need for access to the network on a priority basis. Um, the analogy I like to use is a freeway system. A freeway is resource limited. There's only so many lanes on a given freeway. That's uh, engineered to anticipate the number of cars on the freeway. It's contention based in that each car contends for its spot on the freeway and there's too much traffic. Um, if, if there's too much traffic, that's going to result in congestion and ultimately delays in getting to your destination. So the options for delivering emergency alerts uh, are, are really two. Uh, there's point to point where individual messages can be sent from a notification center to individual devices on the network. And those types of point to point messages include the short message service and, and app push notifications. Um, they are sent to a mobile device and are not geolocation based. The other is a broadcast where the message is broadcast from all cell sites in a specific geographic area. And all devices capable of receiving the broadcast within that area, they'll, they'll receive the message. Um, you don't have to know the location uh, of the device or the identity of the device, and it's more secure. Um, the point-to-point -point or app-based solutions, um, they are going to add significant traffic to an already resource-limited contention-based system. Um, and depending upon the number of messages and the network conditions, you'll likely see congestion and blocking and delays and, and possibly miss the window of opportunity for warning. Uh, it does add to the network load. Uh, it increases the chances of blocking other communications, uh, including public safety, 911, and, and any health and welfare messages. And it's geo-targeted challenge. Um, you, you really, uh, it's left to the app to determine, uh, and, and that's gonna add more traffic on the network. Whereas the broadcast system, uh, that doesn't use the, the what I call the lanes of the freeway, uh, but it's a mass transit solution in our analogy. Uh, it maximizes the chances for getting the notification out uh, within the window of opportunity. It doesn't significantly contribute to the traffic load on the network, and it's geo-targeted to the cell site uh, sector level by design. Um, when you look at uh, the end-to-end -end alert flow uh, from the alert originator uh, to the mobile device, uh, you go through FEMA IPAWS. Uh, within the operator network, uh, there's a uh, what's known as a CMSP gateway or commercial mobile service provider gateway and cell broadcast center. Uh, there's a mobility management entity, uh, the enhanced node B, uh, which is essentially the radio network, and then broadcasting out uh, the alert information to the mobile device. And all of these uh, interfaces defined uh, are standardized in, in a group called the Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Solution or ADIS, uh, as well as the third generation partnership project, which defines mobility standards. And again, there's a number of standards that come into play. 
uh, that define each one of those interfaces and entities within the architecture. Uh, and um, those standards are what governs uh, the, the ability to transmit the emergency alerts from the alert origination side all the way down to your, your cell phones. Um, again, there's a number of XML-based interfaces. Uh, on the left side of, of FEMA IPAWS, uh, we mentioned the CAP protocol. On the right side, at, at the commercial mobile uh, service provider gateway, there's a similar uh, XML-based protocol called the, the C interface protocol, uh, which is a trimmed down version of the CAP protocol, sending only those elements to the mobile networks that are required in order to support uh, the emergency alert as it's being broadcast over the cellular system. In addition to um, FEMA, there, there's also a backup um, delivery of, of emergency alerts to mobile carriers through the public broadcast system. And this is known as the PBS Warning Alert and Response Network or WARN Network. Um, the standards define a way that FEMA will send to all the PBS stations uh, within the country um, the wireless emergency alerts, which will then on every PBS broadcast station nationwide would broadcast the wireless emergency alerts that can be used by mobile carriers for getting the information from FEMA and then broadcasting out to their subscribers. Um, that's known what's known as a C1 interface in, in the architecture. And it's um, you know, supported again as, as a result of the uh, original Congressional Warren Act um, allocated funding to PBS in order to provide this backup system. Um, there's a website there, uh, warren.pbs.org. Uh, they have a very nice graphical display of all the wireless emergency alerts nationwide, uh, and also a historical record of all wireless emergency alerts. Uh, so you can actually go there, uh, look at any particular state or, or county, uh, and see what alerts are active or were active at any point in time. Uh, and it's a very useful tool if you want to uh, go back and look at some of the history of what alerts happened in, in any geographic area within the country. Um, we worked on a project with Arizona State University, PBS, uh, to develop a Raspberry Pi PBS receiver and decoder. Uh, and this would allow you to actually um, receive a PBS signal in your local area, use this decoder, and then see the alerts on your mobile device or on your computer. Uh, so again, it's, it's just another way of getting the alert uh, and viewing the alerts. Um, there's a, a particular message flow defined between the CMSP gateway, which receives the alerts from FEMA out to the radio broadcast. Um, there's what's known as system information blocks or SIDs that are broadcast uh, continuously by the cellular system and broadcast information that is um, used by the cell phone in order to determine how to access and, and how to operate on that particular system. Um, this again is continuously broadcast by all cell sites. And uh, one of those system information blocks or SIB-12 is what was uh, originally known as the commercial mobile alert service or is now known as wireless emergency alerts. That's where that's contained. You'll see SIB-10 and 11 have what's known as the earthquake and tsunami warning system. Um, that's actually a system that's used in Japan. Uh, it's not currently used here in the US. Um, that was uh, desi designed for uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, warnings uh, in, in Japan. Uh, but SIB-12 is, is what we use here in the US. And again, it's broadcast on the uh, system information block on every control channel, on every cell site, uh, by all participating operators, so that you know it basically covers uh, covers uh, all all cell towers nationwide. 
Um, and, and each uh, message class is defined a specific message identifier. And uh, again, these are based on um, the severity, urgency, and certainty of the messages. And the, each of the imminent threat alerts are given a, a certain message identifier uh, based on those three uh, alert categories. And then they're broadcast out to the mobile device using those message identity values. That way the mobile device can um, easily decode the, the severity, urgency, and certainty of a particular message and, and process accordingly. Um, as, as you're probably aware, you know, uh, mobile devices are in fact mobile. <laughs> they, 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 they tend to move about. Uh, and as a result of that, you could be in, in an area where you're unable to receive the uh, initial transmission of an emergency alert. So during the active period of an alert, we go through retransmissions and rebroadcasts of an alert so that it's, it's not only broadcast once, but it's broadcast periodically over the uh, full period that that alert is active. Uh, each alert is uh, has an expiration time that is provided by the alert originator. Uh, and let's say the alert is active for 30 minutes. Well, every minute for 30 minutes, that alert is rebroadcast by the cell towers. So any devices that might have missed the alert on the first broadcast can pick it up in one of the subsequent broadcasts. So if your device is off and you suddenly turn it on, or if you're in an elevator or other RF shadow, once you come into coverage um, and, and that alert is still active, you can pick up one of the rebroadcasts and, and you'll be alerted at the time your device uh, ultimately receives the alert. Um, this uh, increases the reliability of getting that alert. And also this is used if you're outside the alert area and move into the alert area, um, you'll, you'll display the alert once you move into the alert area. Um, WIA is limited. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you can define a, a circle or a polygon uh, to define the geographic area on where an alert is going to be issued. Um, that the number of coordinates within this, the, the polygon is restricted uh, between one and 100 coordinates for those shapes. Um, so you can have one polygon with 100 vertices, or you can have one polygon with 85 vertices and 15 circles. You know, you can you can mix and match how you define your geometric shapes uh, for each alert. Uh, typically, you'll see just a polygon with, uh, you know, a number of vertices uh, to that polygon. Uh, but the main reason why they're limited is uh, to reduce the possibility of, of overloading the broadcast channel. And, and you want to reduce the latency because you're going to have to figure out where that uh, polygon covers and which cell sites are going to cover that polygon. Um, the FCC requirement is to get 100% RF coverage of the alert area. You know, and again, that's subject to network topology where you have cell sites. Um, you want to maximize the probability for devices in the alert area to receive the wireless emergency alert. And, and as you know, uh, RF does not stop at geopolitical boundaries. Um, so there is always the potential for an overshoot. So what we did is... Uh, we, we defined um, uh, a, a way to uh, uh, use the location of the mobile device compared to the location of the alert area to try to figure out whether or not you were inside or outside. And as part of this, in order to cover 100% of, of the alert area, you're, you're going to pick cell sites both within the polygon as well as outside the polygon. And you pick cell sites outside the polygon because they're actually going to have uh, enough RF signal within that polygon in order to provide uh, service to that mobile device. That is that mobile device would be able to read the control channel from those cell sites that are outside the polygon. Uh, so in the event, you know, there's, there's, 
uh, an issue with any of the cell sites within the polygon, uh, they would still be able to, to receive the wireless emergency alert from, from those cell sites outside the polygon. And, and we call this the best server method. Uh, it segments the warning area into bins, uh, which are those uh, squares that you see in, in that middle diagram. Um, RF modeling tool plots the best serving uh, cell site for each bin. And then each cell site and sector that provides the greatest percentage of coverage to the bin uh, is chosen to be used to broadcast the WIA message for that particular polygon. And what you end up with, you know, if you see on the right, um, that, that blue box, uh, assuming that's your uh, polygon, that's your alert area, um, you're going to pick cell sites that cover all those other areas. And you can see that there's going to be quite a bit uh, of coverage outside of the actual alert area uh, that's that's being broadcast, that's broadcasting the wireless emergency alert. Um, we have 1.0 and 2.0 devices. Uh, they don't know where the alert is targeted. Um, the geo coordinates of the alert area aren't delivered to the device. And thus the device is going to present the WIA upon receipt independent of the location. <clears throat> and any cell towers who are, whose RF signal touch, touch the uh, alert area are gonna broadcast that WIA. And the, the consequence is you're gonna get overshoot and undershoot uh, of, of the WIA message. Well, it, it, this is especially evident in rural areas where you have boomer cells, that is high powered cells. Uh, there's fewer cell sites, they're spread far farther apart and they're higher power. So the precise geo-targeting uh, is gonna be difficult uh, with, with broadcast alone. And the potential in, in these uh, rural areas are you're gonna get overshoot uh, and in fact, many miles of overshoot. So we have 3.0 geo-targeting um, lets the mobile device figure out if it's in the alert area or not, and whether it should display the alert. So even though we overshoot in, in the broadcast of the wireless alert and emergency alert messages, um, the mobile device will figure out wh whether it's in the alert area, and then if it's in the alert area, it will then display the alert. If it's outside the alert area, it won't display the alert. So this is one of the major advances we've had uh, with WIA 3.0 that didn't exist on those earlier versions and, and actually um, helped us eliminate some of the um, problems that were reported on those earlier uh, versions of WIA. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, the mobile device itself uh, is going to determine whether it should present the alert or not. And, and this is uh, dependent upon many things, uh, including duplication detection. Uh, you know, was the alert previously received? Remember, I talked about the alert is rebroadcast over the entire duration of, of the alert interval. Well, you don't want to keep <clears throat> repeating that alert presentation to the user. Uh, every time it's received during that rebroadcast period. So if the alert was previously received and displayed, it's then discarded, it's not re-displayed. Uh, also, uh, we have 3.0 processing. Again, if the mobile device is in the alert area, it will present the alert. Uh, if it's not in the alert area, it won't present it. Um, I mentioned, um, the frequencies of 853 and 960 hertz uh, previously, uh, way back, you know, from the Conrad days. Well, the WIA audio attention signal that you hear on your mobile phone uh, actually consists of those fundamental frequencies transmitted simultaneously. Uh, the only difference is there's a temporal pattern of one long tone uh, of two seconds followed by two short tones of one second each with a half second between each tone. Uh, the reason for adding that uh, actually came from uh, those that are familiar with individuals with disabilities and the temporal pattern actually helps in detecting and understanding that the emergency alert is, is coming in. 
Uh, this happens not only with the audio attention signal, but also with the vibration cadence, which also is used to uh, alert a user on a cell phone. Um, <clears throat> WIA has been tested several times on a national level. Uh, the first was on October 3rd of 2018, uh, which demonstrated that WIA is an effective alerting tool to get information to the public. <clears throat> um, this, is a nation, this was a nationwide test, and based on the survey data, most people reported successful receipt of the WIA test message. <clears throat> and several news reports noted the success of the nationwide test. What's interesting to note, on the date of that test, uh, John McAfee, uh, who is also running for the United States uh, presidential election in 2020 and, and of McAfee uh, software, uh, he made a false statement that the presidential alert involved the E911 system and alleged that phones have a E911 chip that was capable of giving government access to the phone's location and microphone. Well, that's totally false. <laughs> there is no E911 chip in the device, and there, uh, WIA does not connect to the E911 system whatsoever. The second test was run on August 11th, 2021, uh, and uh, this was broadcast for about 30 minutes. And this, the difference here, though, this was directed only to consumer cell phones with a subscriber opted into receiving the test messages. And again, it was generally proven reliable. Uh, about 90% of the respondents uh, received the test uh, and, and received it within two minutes. And uh, the reliability, you know, was consistent across service providers, uh, generation of mobile technology, uh, mobile device manufacturer and operating system types, <clears throat> indoors, outdoors, um, you know, fairly consistent results across the board. Um, many mobile devices, however, received a duplicate nationwide test message. It was one of the, the downsides reported. Um, next up, uh, there is going to be another test on October 4th of this year uh, that will consist of both WIA and EAS. And it's scheduled to begin at approximately 2.20 on Wednesday, October 4th. And uh, cell towers will, uh, again, broadcast for about 30 minutes. It's going to be using the, the national alert. Uh, so every cell phone will receive it. Uh, we are compatible phones uh, uh, that are capable uh, should receive it. Uh, there'll be a message that says this is a test of the national wireless emer emergency alert system. No action is needed. Uh, and also a Spanish version of the test as well. Uh, there are so, all, also capabilities for state and local agencies to test WIA uh, without coordination with the FCC or FEMA. These are what's known as the state and local test. Um, <clears throat> in order to do that, you have to include, you know, plain language message that says, uh, you know, it's only a test. And consumer phones, um, are, are delivered dis with the state and local tests disabled. So consumers that wanna receive those tests have to go into the device setting and actually enable the ability for their devices to receive them. Uh, and uh, to observe the results, uh, you need a group of participants uh, with their phones configured uh, in order to uh, see the results of those tests. Um, there's also practical hints documents for alert originators uh, that are available, uh, as well as, you know, uh, two pagers uh, that gives <clears throat> some of the uh, reasons why some of the issues that have been noted with wireless emergency alerts happen. Um, so as far as we are in amateur radio, uh, it's another emergency alerting tool. Uh, again, the heaviest user of wireless emergency alerts is the weather service. So this would become especially useful for Skywarn spotters, uh, especially with the geo-targeting uh, that's in WIA 3.0 or all the newer devices, uh, because it will really pinpoint where the actual occurrence of, of the severe weather is. And it's also have the ability to partner with your state and local agencies to test WIA capabilities. 
So in summary, um, you know, going back to emergency alert system, knowing which radio and TV stations that serve as primary entry points for emergency messages uh, could be beneficial uh, as part of your overall emergency communications plan. And also knowing which stations are primary sources for your state and local levels as well. Uh, WIA is a powerful emergency alerting tool. Uh, keep all message categories enabled and enable state and local tests uh, in order to get the most benefit. And participate in and, and report your receipt of the October test uh, coming up. Uh, check with your local agency to see if they're participating. And also FEMA will likely have a survey asking for data. You know, things such as did you receive the WIA test? What time did you receive it? and where you were when you received it, as well as the make, model, and OS version of your phone. So with that, um, I'll also have in here a number of links, uh, which provides a lot of information. Uh, so uh, they'll be in the handout that will accompany this. And with that, let me open it for questions. You want verbal questions or raise hand? How do you how you do it here? Uh, there are some questions in chat. I'll get get them for you. Did you say was the is there an internet alert protocol or just a wireless protocol? Because I mean I've heard of it, but I've never seen one. Uh, let's see. Oh, and internet? No, I, I said that no, there wasn't an internet alert protocol. It's called a common alerting protocol, I believe. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, had been looking at internet protocols uh, for emergency alerts. I don't know if any of those had ever been deployed, though. And it was just the famous instance in Hawaii where they set off the <laughs> And I guess this October there's going to be another there's going to be a nationwide test of the emergency system that was on the um, FCC reflector today. Yes, yeah, I, that, that was the test I mentioned in October of this year. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, the, the Hawaii incident, yeah, the infamous Hawaii incident. So that actually turned out to be operator error, um, where they meant to send out test message, uh, but it turned out to be an actual live event. And, and as you, you, you may remember, that was during the days where North Korea was doing a lot of missile tests and threatening the US. And uh, unfortunately, it went out to Hawaii and caused quite a panic. Um, it looked like a live, you know, live alert with incoming missiles from North Korea and caused quite a panic. And we remember still today. <laughs> yes. Okay, Barry, you got anything more there? We are all up to date in chat now, Dan. Okay, got any hands raised? We got one from Daniel. Go ahead, Dan. <clears throat> this was, a, excuse me. <laughs> this was a great presentation. You packed in more information <laughs> about national alert systems than I've ever seen in a given day <laughs> into, a, uh, into this presentation. Um, given the international um, news cycle, um, are they going to be advertising the October 4th WIA alert well in advance so that you know, nobody has that uh oh moment when, <laughs> well, they, yeah. when, when you're when you're yeah. If 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 that tone you're talking about is what I think it is, just hearing that sort of triggers oh oh oh. <laughs> yeah, they they've actually started today. Uh, there was a press release that went out today. I think somebody mentioned that in in the chat. Um, but yes, the, the intent is to get that widely disseminated so that everybody knows that on October 4th at 2.20 in the afternoon, this is only a test. <laughs> so, and, I, I, and my other question was regarding the Connell Red alert. Um, 
So this obviously was when amateur radio operators were still in business. So it wasn't during World War II. Right. But how were you notified you could get back on the air again? Um, actually, the Conrad system, they would give you uh, an all clear message. So it would come out on those same two frequencies that the alert is over all clear. Okay. So you leave your radios on and, and yeah, uh, yeah, they'll just tell you. Okay. You continue monitoring those frequencies, right? All right. Really good presentation. Thank you. You should do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, Gene, you got your hand up. Uh, uh, yeah, guys. Hey, how's everybody doing? Greetings from Colleen, Texas. Uh, my question is, okay, we are in a, we are a country that we have a northern border country and a southern border country. Emergency just ha don't just happen affecting one country. Right. How do these uh, communication systems go across borders? And once they do, who has control of them? Sure. Well, the, the wireless emergency alert system, there is actually a similar system in Canada uh, that, that's supported as well, um, which uses this, the same technology that we use here in the U.S. <clears throat> so, yes, you know, if, you, if your cell phone is camped on a Canadian system and, and, the, and, and Canada issues an alert, you're going to get it, uh, you know, receive that alert here in the U.S. So <clears throat> you... you there, there's a, a, a little bit of uh, challenge there. Um, you know, part of it is, you know, as your cell phone being a U.S.-based cell phone should look for a U.S.-based system first. So it shouldn't pick up the Canadian system. But, you know, I've driven, you know, through the southern border where I picked up, you know, Mexic Mexico cell system you know my my device would camp on the mexican cell system before so it it happens so yeah there are going to be those challenges um there also have been uh cross-border tests uh between us and and canada uh at the northern border uh testing interoperability between systems and coordination between the two agencies uh, um, cross-border. There's still a lot to be worked out there uh, because both systems, even though they've been in place around 10 years, they're still fairly new. Is that an FCC coordination type of thing or some of the federal FEMA, agency? Yeah, pr FEMA primarily. FEMA working okay. with their counterparts up in, up in Canada. Do you know what the uh, Canadian counterpart is of uh, FEMA? I, Just curious. I, I I don't off the top of my head. I, I know that <laughs> I don't remember the acronym for them. Okay, no problem. Yeah. All right. Anybody hey, else? Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. It really has been. Anybody else want to put their hand up or put something in chat? No, we'll open it up for general con uh, comments. Anybody got any comments out there? Well, <laughs> it was a great presentation. Obviously, uh, I don't know how to. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just you did a great job. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Okay, um, you're going to send me the uh, your your slides afterwards. Yeah, it should be in your inbox already. So. All right. Well, thank you much. I probably should close this down. Wish everybody. Uh, a happy weekend coming up and hope to see you next week again. Thanks, Brian. Great presentation. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks, everyone. 73s.